moving around? It's fine. We, we, uh, we, your mom, grand and great grandparents here, and we delight in these sounds because we don't normally have them around our house. Uh, and uh, we enjoy it, but praise the Lord. That's awesome. So don't you be worried or bothered at all. Praise the Lord. Thank you. We've been looking uh, for a number of weeks now at seed in the Word of God. We started in Genesis 3, do you recall? A passage that we've read across many times, and many of us uh, have not seen. That when God put the curse on the serpent, Satan, it wasn't on a physical snake, it was on Satan himself. He said that your seed is going to be at enmity with the seed of the woman. And of course, Eve is a picture of the church giving life to the body of Christ in the world. And there is a war that's going on. And you'll remember that uh, some of you were really delighted that uh, on the Sunday before Christmas that I told you, welcome to the war. <laughs> Christmas is a good time to be aware of that. Because Jesus said, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. Uh, unfortunately, that song that we hear at Christmas time is a mistranslation. Jesus said, don't think I came to bring peace on the earth. I didn't, I came to bring a sword. And that sword is the sword of the truth. And the sword of the truth reveals itself in the scriptures. And so the seed we've been talking about gets planted here, enters through our thoughts, and has access to the soil of our heart. 1 Corinthians says that we're God's field, and He's sowing seed here. Numerous parables Jesus spoke tell us about what happens with that seed as it's received in the heart. And you remember we read, uh, what was it, in uh, Matthew 13, the parable where it, Jesus described the world as a, a landowner, and His employees came and said, uh, Sir, how can we have all these tares here growing among the wheat? We thought you used good seed, and He said an enemy came and did this. And that's reference again that Jesus was making to Genesis 3 that there would be enmity between those who take in the seed, the thoughts and ideas into their heart from Satan that translate themselves into the horrible things we see humans doing to one another here in this world. And then there's also the seed that God's sowing that we find in the Scriptures. And we need to receive that seed into our hearts. I want to start in John chapter 1. We've been looking at this some. Again, I remind you, Jesus is your teacher. The Holy Spirit will lead and guide you into all the truth. That's why we have the bucket up here. You hear something that seems bizarre or strange, uh, don't believe it just because I say it. Put it in the pot that's on the back burner back there and let it simmer. And you ask God, God, if this is true, you show me. And if God doesn't confirm to you that it's so, don't receive it. What I believe to be one of the the great distortions of Scripture is in John chapter 1. Now, understand, the Scriptures, it's okay to call them the Word of God, because that they are. However, they're the record of the Word. They are the written, recorded record of the Word of God. And John chapter 1, Big John, the Gospel says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And down a few verses, then he tells us, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Which verse is that? Oh, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the Word of God. The Scriptures are the record of the Word. And from Genesis 3 all the way to the end of the Revelation, the things that have not transpired yet, all of that is about the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, God who took on human form, holy man and holy God at the same time. And it's that seed that we need to have implanted into our hearts, and that's what he's talking about right here when he says in verse 11, He came to His own, Jesus, the Word who became flesh. Those who were His own did not receive Him. You say, oh, that was all the Jewish people who rejected Him. No, you need to understand all the disciples of Jesus were Jewish people, okay? But it was the religious leaders who repudiated and rejected Jesus. Very much like we have in denominations all across our land where we have 
leadership that is not interested in the things of God. They're building a career, a reputation. They're building their own empires. And yet people in the congregations are really not knowledgeable and perhaps oblivious of some of the motives of the religious leaders. I'll say again, as I've said before, I believe that if Jesus Christ came physically to the United States of America, there would be a conspiracy of religious leaders and churches in America today who would conspire to have him murdered, just like the religious leaders did back then. So he came to his own, and his own didn't receive him, verse 12 says, but as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God. That's that Greek word dunamis that I've referred to you a number of times. The power. It's the word we get dynamite from. The power of God to become children of God. Um, the, uh, uh, the reality is here that many people are told you receive Jesus into your heart. You receive the seed and you're born again because he goes on and says that these are those who believe in his name who are born not of blood or the will of the flesh nor the will of man, but of God. But that verse does not say that when you receive Jesus, you're born again. It says you get the dunamis, the power, the right to become children of God. Conception takes place. Let me ask you, is there life in the womb? Uh, the ladies here can definitely attest to that. Oh my goodness, boom, boom, stretching everything out in there, trying to make space. Yes, there's life in the womb. But all of that happens before the birth. And what happens, and I'm seeing confirmed more and more all through Scripture, is when you receive Jesus, you get the right to become. You get the birth right. And that enlightens for us the puzzling, sometimes puzzling Scripture, because we've been taught that God loves everybody. No, that's not true. He loves humanity. He loves His creation here. But there are a lot of people in the Bible that are specifically identified as people whom God hates. And so God hated Esau. Why? Because he was a picture of people like most American Christians who receive Jesus and get the right, the power to become God's children. And they're spiritually aborted. And they never come to the new birth. Now, if that bothers you, I invite you to our studies on 1 John, because in 1 John, he tells us and describes the person who's born again. And let me tell you what. I can look through all of the churches that I've been in, and I haven't known very many people that qualify according to what John tells us in 1 John. And unfortunately, that's because a lot received Jesus, and then their heart went after other things, they received the seed of the enemy. Remember that Jesus said in the third kind of soil where the four hearts are described, the birds come and steal it away, and then in another place he gets scorched because of persecution, trials, and difficulties, and they abandon Jesus, the third kind. The thorns and the thistles grow up, and they choke out the Word of God so that it doesn't bear the fruit that it was designed to bear. Why? Because people's hearts went after other things. See, God hated Esau because he had so little regard for his birthright that he traded it away for one meal because he was hungry. And there are many American Christians who've received the right to become children of God and they don't come to the place of being birthed into the new birth because they traded away the things of the world, the things of the flesh, building a name, reputation, whatever, other things enter in and choke the word and it doesn't bear the fruit that it's designed to bear. So as many as received him to them, he gave the power to become children of God. But we have to walk in it and that's what we see over and over again in Scripture. I want you to go with me to 1 Peter. If you go to the Revelation of John and turn left and skip over Jude and the little Johns that talk about the qualities of the person who is born again and get to First and Second Peter. First Peter, the first chapter. He, in this passage, also talks about the seed. The seed is talked about by John. It's talked about by Peter. It's talked about by James. It's talked about from cover to cover in this book. All the gospel writers and many of the prophets specifically refer to how you can tell when you've received the seed of God into your heart. 
And so in 1 Peter, 1st chapter, he identifies himself, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who reside as aliens. You see, when you commit your way and you give your life to Jesus, then guess what? He's going to lead you to do things that don't fit in the comfort zone of the society that you're in. That's certainly true in America today. I, I really never thought that I would see in my lifetime more laws made that directly contradict the Word of God like we have seen in my 60-some years kicking around here on this planet. It's astonishing. We are aliens and strangers because our hearts and our minds are set on the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of us are still on the fence trying to decide which way we're going to go. You want to fit in with American society and you want to uh, swallow all the vitriol that they're pouring out and you want to take in their seed, guess whose seed you're taking in? It's not God's. It's the seed of Satan. And so he identifies those to whom he's addressed it as aliens because they didn't fit in with their society. And I believe that uh, I may live long enough now. I didn't think I would ever have uh, thought this to be true. I may live long enough to see... To, to see physical persecution and physical death of Christian people in the United States of America sanctioned by, or at least ignored by, our government. And that's happening all around the world. America has been one of the few places that's been exempt from that. And, of course, the burning and destruction of Bibles, is we're not far from seeing that happening in the United States of America, folks. We better wake up and start making a commitment in our hearts. Are we going to cooperate with all that the American society demands of us, or are we going to stand on God's Word? Thankfully, the majority of Americans still stand on God's Word. You just wouldn't know it uh, because they're not, the majority of Martin Hollywood are uh, on the nightly news. But the reality is, the vast majority of Americans are still god fearing people. And by the way, that's the reason this nation is still here. If the people trying in this uh, social revolution, trying to change our society and disavow any connection to God's morals and principles, if they get their way, uh, then this American that we know won't live any longer. But they're not getting their way yet. You know, in the United States, more than 85% of American population claims to believe in God. Europe was once like that, Western Europe. Guess what it is in England now? 15% percent absolute inverse and it was a place that revival swept across and it was exported to the colonies and brought to here to the United States and they've allowed it to be abandoned because they wouldn't continue to acknowledge that they're aliens and strangers and walk in those ways they gave themselves over to the things of men and he says these are people who are chosen, verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit that you may obey Jesus Christ, be sprinkled with His blood, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. One of the points that Peter makes is that people that are yielding to Jesus Christ as Lord actually obey Him. What a novel idea! Amazing! I'm telling you, a lot of American Christians don't think that's important. Many American Christian churches don't even teach the Ten Commandments anymore. Oh, we don't need those. You just believe and acknowledge Jesus. And you can, you know, put a little poster of Jesus up there right next to your favorite football team or your favorite baseball team because you believe in the Diamondbacks and, you know, the Cowboys and the Green Bay Packers and, you know, oh, and Jesus too. Let me tell you, that's not the kind of life-transforming power that people receive when they receive the right to become the dunamis to become the children of God. It's not that kind of faith. It's genuine, it's real, and they want to do the things that are pleasing to the Lord. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again. To what? To a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of the dunamis of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. When we do our study of uh, those uh, four days at the end of March, we're going to do a study on what salvation is and what the new birth is. And we're going to see what the Bible has to say about it. By the way, do you notice here that he refers to the salvation being something in the future? Or are you saying that people who receive Jesus aren't saved? No, Scripture says they're saved. 
But you know what else it says? That we are being saved. And then it says we will be saved from the wrath of God on that day. Salvation is an ongoing experience and an ongoing walk with God. And that's why one of Paul's writings, he says, today is the day of salvation. Oh, no, no, I asked Jesus into my life in East Texas in 1967. Yes, I did. That was the day of salvation. But guess what today was? Today's the day of salvation. I got up today and I chose that I'm going to yield myself to Jesus as best that I can. Today's the day of salvation and we walk in it. And that's what he's saying right here. And he says in verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, even though for a little while if necessary you may be distressed. And see, even the kids occasionally get distressed. And I know some of you go out of here kind of like that too. Oh, I'm not quite as loud about it. So nothing really changes. We just get bigger. But, you know, and we're distressed uh, once in a while. And I love when I encounter a child who's really upset in the store somewhere because they're not getting what they want. And, you know, I love going up to them and tell them, guess what? It only gets worse. <laughs> I don't like it. I'm not getting my way. Well, get used to it. Okay. And I actually do get a smile occasionally on the parents. Sometimes I get a scowl from them. <laughs> But you see, we're distressed by various trials. But he says, verse 7, the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, look what it's going to do that as you endure through these things. May be found a result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, Janet, twice you've lost spouses now. And yet... God's got something waiting for you out there. You may be distressed a little while along the way. No one in this room is exempt from it. We all have wounds and scars. The question is, what are you doing about those wounds and scars? Are you carrying in your heart animosity toward the one who did evil and ill to you? Folks, I'm finding the biggest sin in the American church, the biggest sin today, is unforgiveness. And you don't get forgiveness from God if you don't forgive your fellow man. It doesn't matter what it was. It doesn't mean what they did is okay. But you commend it to the Lord. And you say, God, I choose to forgive them and I commend that situation to you. But we're being tested like by fire. But what it's going to result in is praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus. And he says this beautiful thing in verse 8. And though you have not seen him... You love him. Peter was astounded by this. Because Peter had seen him. You remember this is the same Peter. Catching fish with Jesus. Feeding the thousands. And when he saw him walking on the water, he got out of the boat and started walking toward him. This is the Peter I have seen him in, I believe. But look, he says, though you've not seen him, you love him. And though you don't see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with a joy inexpressible and full of glory. And watch this. Obtaining as the outcome of your faith, the end result, the salvation of your souls. How do we get that salvation? Oh, if we strain this. No, 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 no. Only a fool who sees the standards of holiness and righteousness of God in this book could think that he could ever do enough things to win God's favor. All you can do is repent. See, it's a choice. You are active. You choose to turn from your failings and sin and reach out to God for mercy. And when you receive that mercy, it stirs up in you love, a love for Him. And the scripture tells us it wasn't. It wasn't that we love God. That's not why we get His favor. He first loved us. Amen. All we're doing is learning to love Him back because of the love that He has bestowed on us. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. How is this even possible? Because the Lord Jesus Christ poured out His life in the form of His blood as the perfect sacrifice. So that we sinful humans could have our sins washed away and forgiven. And we can have a relationship with holy God who can't look on sin. And you see, that's the message that's been delivered from Genesis 3 all the way to the end of the Revelation. Verse 10, he says, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace, 
I need to pause again at grace. There's a lot of misunderstanding of what grace is. In American churches, it's been completely misdefined. Many of you have been taught that grace is God's undeserved favor. That is not what grace is. Grace is different than that because undeserved favor is mercy. That's what we get. Oh, thankfully, God is merciful. We get His undeserved favor. That's what we need. We need mercy. He gives us mercy. Then what is this grace thing? It's not the same thing. It is in His influence that comes in our heart by the Holy Spirit. It's His influence that changes us into a different kind of life and a different kind of walk. My wife and I have soon be 46 years we've been hanging out together and, and we're completely different people than when we started out. Besides the fact that I have hair. But, uh, you know, my grandkids look and they don't even recognize me in old photographs. No, I'm talking about we're different people in our hearts and in our demeanor and in our attitudes because the Word of God, the dunamis, is working and changing us and molding us and shaping us into His image. So the salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace, the influence that would come to you made careful search and inquiry, knowing what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating. I have to pause again to push back against some erroneous teaching here. Many people have been taught that the Holy Spirit didn't come until the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is in Genesis 1 in creation. The Holy Spirit is working all through the uh, exodus and the healing of sickness and disease and the miracles done by Elijah and Elisha. All of that was performed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, there were people that said, oh, no, no, the Holy Spirit was only on people. He wasn't in them. Well, guess what? Peter says in verse 11, the Holy Spirit was within these prophets. Who are we talking about? Hosea and Amos and Nahum. And Obadiah. Yeah. All of that good stuff back there. Some of you could even say them with me. All of those guys. Say them with me. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. All of those guys. Plus the major prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, who wrote Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. All of that. All of those guys wanted to know what the Holy Spirit was indicating as He inspired them to record on scrolls, as God tells Isaiah, write it down on a scroll that it may stand as a witness in the future. God had us in mind in the year 2020 when He told Isaiah, write this down 800 years before Jesus was born because 2,800 years from now there's some people who are going to want to know the truth and I want them to be able to know the truth. Now, there have been many efforts by powerful men and political regimes to destroy those things. One of the worst happened in 303 when the Emperor Diocletian wanted to get rid of all of the Christians out of the Roman Empire. And they ransacked the town of Caesarea and destroyed over 40,000 manuscripts of the Scriptures. That was in the year 303. Guess what, Diocletian, you lose. Because here we are 2,000 years later, 1,700 years later, and we still get to read what God said to Isaiah and what He said through these prophets. They wanted to know about this future, what was going to happen when Messiah, the coming one, came. As they, verse 11 says, predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Listen to this, verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, Peter says, and these things which have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. And what is that verse 12? What are the implications of that? When Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, is walking through the ruined city of Jerusalem, and he writes about it in the Lamentations of Jeremiah, the book of Lamentations, as he's walking through the city, he's seen where there was prosperity and there was the sound of children and activity and joy and singing. There was silence and destroyed buildings and destruction. And he was so moved, he wept. And you know why he wept? Not because some buildings were torn down. 
Not because things weren't like what they used to be. It was revealed to Jeremiah that the destruction in this city is a picture of what's going to happen to the churches of God and the people of God in the future. And he wept. And we're witnesses of those things. You see, it was revealed to them they were not serving themselves. What that's saying is they were not serving their day. Yes, it physically, historically, all of these things happened. But Paul comes along and says, Abraham had two sons. One by the bondwoman, one by the free. Okay, how do you get that? I go back and read about these, these uh, two sons that he had. But you see, Paul had spiritual insight. He looked at it and said, these are two different groups of people and two covenants. The, the son by the flesh is like the people in the physical city of Jerusalem, but we're part of the spiritual descendants, the, the descendants who came by promise. You see, that's what was understood by them way back there. The things they physically went through were teaching lessons to us. That's why in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, I remind you about all those things that happened to the children of Israel. He said that they're in the wilderness and the rock, the, out of the rock came the water to feed them in a desert land. And he says, oh, by the way, the rock was Jesus. And he said, oh, when the people were rebellious and sinning, God sent snakes to bite them and they died. Guess what that's a picture of? God removing his hedge of protection and allow Satan and the forces of darkness to devour God's people. That's what he's talking about. It was revealed to them the spiritual implications for physically and historically what they went through. Then he says in verse 13, therefore gird your minds for action. Be sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace, the influence of God to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children do not be conformed to the former lust which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior because it's written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Wow. That's what God's calling us to. That's what the new birth produces in us. That's what the grace, the influence of God by His Spirit changes in us. And I, I love that song we sing today, Change My Heart, O God. You're the potter, I'm the clay. Am I really in my heart yielding myself to God in that manner? Or is it kind of like, yeah, God, I want the fire insurance at the end, but I got the handle on it right now. You know? <laughs> See, for a lot of people, that's, that's kind of what it is. So I'll check in with you once a week, God, for an hour. I'll punch in and punch out. But I'm going to go do my own thing the rest of the time. Oh, by the way, I don't have to come next week because that preacher's been so long-winded that i got a full hour's credit. <laughs> but you'll still own it because, you know, you see, that's why he's calling us folks to something different, to holiness. And verse 17, he says, If you address his father, the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, to your deeds, your actions, your attitudes... He says, conduct yourselves in fear. I love this. During the time of your stay on the earth. <laughs> Enjoying the vacation? Sometimes is it fun? Getting to travel and see grandma and grandpa? Yeah. During the time of your stay here on the earth. That's, that's all this is. It's a temporary uh, a trip that we're on right here as God forms us into his image. And so he's telling us that he's doing all this, and we need to remember that we were not redeemed, verse 18, with gold and silver, but, verse 18, with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless. And so, verse 22, I want you to see this before we conclude. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, there is no walking with God without loving your fellow man. John describes that as the righteousness of God is how you love your neighbor. God's not in the ceremony business, people. You can go to ceremonies, uh, you know, till the day that you die. That's not going to mean anything to God because God is primarily concerned about your relationship with your fellow man, your spouse, your relations, your neighbor, the coworker, the clerk, whatever, every human that you encounter. God's concerned about that. In verse 22, since you have in obedience to the truth purify your soul for a sincere love of the brother fervently love one another from the heart for you have been born again not of seed which is perishable there's that seed again John 1 you receive in your heart Genesis 3 
the seed of the woman. You been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. How? That is through the living and abiding word of God. The things of the earth like grass will fade. The word of the Lord will stand <laughs> forever. This is the seed that is implanted in the hearts of those who will yield themselves to him. Do you see that you're not born again by praying a prayer? It doesn't say you're born again by praying a prayer. It doesn't say you're born again by asking Jesus in your heart. He says you're born again by the word of God getting in the soil of your heart. Which Jesus is the word, the scripture sown in the soil of our heart takes root. And guess what the seed of that word produces in you? Jesus! Boom! And everything that you do. And he wants to do that in your life. Would you pray? Lord Jesus, thank you for the word. Because it is life to us. It's medication to our bones. It's healing to our body. It's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. It's the sword of the Spirit that pierces into our hearts and has done some piercing here today, Lord, I assume. Because you always do that. You're so faithful. And God, I pray that as it pierces into hearts, that there would be willing hearts ready to receive the seed. It says, I want to know you, Jesus, the real Jesus. And Lord, you told us that if we remain in your word, if we abide in your word, then we're truly disciples. And we'll know the truth and the truth will make us free. But Lord, sadly, so many have been happy with just receiving that birthright and have done nothing with it. And yet, God, your power, your life-giving power, your transformative power is there, ready and available, if only we would choose your ways. <coughs> not about going to church meetings. It's not even about singing His songs as much as I love singing praises, Lord. We know it's about our relationship with one another. God, may You be pleased. May Your Spirit and Your grace influence us so that we can fully love our neighbor as ourselves. And Lord, You said if we do that, it's proof that we love You. So God, we ask You to grant that. We ask You to grant it today. I thank You for each of these humans who would take time from all the things that are being called to them, that they would come and be in this meeting. And I pray you'll reward them and honor their efforts by giving them some nuggets of truth, some healing sap, as Jesus, the balm of Gilead, is applied to our heart and soul, and our minds, and even our bodies. And God, good things that come from these moments are always our delight. And it just makes us fall on our knees and thank you that you found us here at the edge of the desert, God. Because your eyes search to and fro throughout the earth, you must strongly support those whose heart is completely yours. And thank you there are some in this company that that's the case. Honor them, Lord, as we know you will. And we'll give you praise and glory as you mold and shape us into your image. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.